Okay, this is Mark, and tonight's show, it's, uh, let's see, it's uh, May 16, 2013. And tonight's show, uh, unfortunately, I have a little bit of a cold tonight, so uh, my voice nuts, you know, might be a little bit uh, scratchy. But uh, tonight's show is really cool. We have a special guest on, and uh, of course, we, uh, of course, you know, everybody knows Ray Harryhausen passed um, away uh, just about a week and a half ago, and uh, it's been pretty sad news, and the whole <clears throat> whole community's been really sad about it, so uh, that's you know what we're going to talk about at first. But uh, we're also going to talk about a project that Peter Montgomery and Ron Cole have been putting together, that is sort of carrying the torch of uh, Ray Harryhausen. Uh, it's sort of like a dynamation technique that they're using with more modern technology. So it's really exciting, and uh, we think that Ray would be excited as well. And uh, unfortunately, he didn't get to see some of the, the Sinbad work that they were working on um, before it was released. But um, they definitely kept him in mind with that. So uh, anyway, to start the show off, uh, we have a special guest. It's Mark. Um, is it Caballero? Is that how you say it? It's uh, Caballero. Caballero. Okay. And he's from Screen Novelties. And um, what they do is they have uh, a studio in L.A., which creates all kinds of uh, really quirky, cartoony stop motion projects, I guess you could say. And uh, they're a collective, so they have lots of people involved. Um, Seamus Walsh is uh, one of the co founders, as well as Christopher Finnegan. And uh, they've done more recently, one of their more popular projects was the SpongeBob Christmas special. Uh, so a lot of people are really excited to see that. <laughs> and. Uh, so anyway, Mark, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit more about maybe um, how Screen Novelties was was created? Like, how did you guys just put that together? Well, um, it's kind of a lengthy story, but I'll, I'll try to trunc uh, truncate it a little bit. Um, Seamus and I met at uh, UCLA Extension uh, we were taking the extension classes together and, and, um, we were, um, I guess uh, I'm just trying to recall so many years ago. Um, we, we were kind of paired up in, in a video class of like, you know, basic camera moves and everything. And, um, we decided that let's just do more than basic camera moves. And we made some crazy video about, I forget what it was. Uh, but we realized that we clicked pretty well together and uh, we both had, uh, common love for um, stop motion and um, we both realized that our favorite movie was Mad Monster Party and we're like oh my gosh so from that point on we kind of like um, would meet at Shay's Garage every weekend and just um, shoot tests and practice making our puppets and everything um, and then when we got to a point where we kind of felt like things were going pretty well we made a couple short films um, and the whole time, rather than, um, you know, after about a semester or two, after um, we realized that the money would be well spent if we made our films instead of paying for tuition, then uh, we might be able to get some more stuff done. And so that's what we did uh, in lieu of uh, going to regular courses. And, you know, I like to consider my university to be the University of Eddie Brand Saturday Matinee which is a local video store here in, in uh, North Hollywood that specializes in really hard to find, um, you know, TV shows, movies, cartoons, you name it. And uh, we got to know the people over there. And so, you know, Shay and I would show up uh, once every couple of weeks and just bring back, you know, like 14 or 15 videotapes of all sorts of like puppetry, stop motion, animation, uh, silent films, live action films. And we just study everything frame by frame. Um, and then we jumped into another short film uh, called Grey Bear Jamboree that um, in the title says a toe tapping screen novelty. And we thought it'd be kind of fun. Like, hey, that sounds like a pretty cool studio name. So we kind of adopted that. And that's sort of how it all started. And then from there, we kind of jumped into, we got hired at um, celebrity Deathmatch, and that's where we kind of uh, got uh, got our animation skills up to date by animate or um, animation skills honed uh, just by animating every day. And the whole time, um, it was around that time that we got in touch with Ray Harryhausen about 
completing the Taurus in the Hair for him. And then it just sort of spiraled. Once we moved back, we, we finished Taurus in the Hair, we got into the Flintstones, and we just started getting more work and more work. And so we've, you know, we officially formed Screen Novelties with Chris Finnegan that we had met over in New York during Deathmatch. And uh, we really liked how he handled things as a producer, and we liked his animation, and his style jived really well with ours. So that's sort of how it all kind of started. Very cool. So you probably, I mean, is that where you learned uh, the, the bulk of your animation skills was in New York? Pretty much. I mean, we, we, did, we did animation, and, you know, we pretty much, every day after our normal jobs, we would go and meet at, we rented a house together that had a big garage, and we would just get out of work and go meet over there and just do animation. And uh, Seamus worked over at the Kyoto Brothers, so they were mentors to us as well. And oh, so we wow. would just do that. Yeah. And um, after we completed The Old Man of the Goblins, that's where we got the offer from MTV to come over and work for them for a while. And um, it was great because... Um, we all got to like learn our individual styles. It was sort of like an unsupervised way of running the show where we kind of just did our own thing, you know, with um, just following the boards and some minimal supervision. And um, we were able to uh, nail down our signature styles of animation, which worked out really nice. And we took that and applied everything we learned to the tortoise and the hare. We really wanted to make sure that... Um, that we were confident in our animation skills to be able to mimic Ray's style. So we devoted ourselves to just animating for somebody else for about a year and a half before we jumped in. Sure. So when you say Ray Harry Huston style, um, a lot of people don't really think of him as a, um, a cartoony styled uh, stop motion animator. They think of him as making like Medusa and all these uh, mythological creatures and or maybe Muddy Joe Young, but when he first started out, um, he did a lot of fairy tale uh, films, correct? Yes, he did. Yeah, he um, he did a, a bunch of fairy tales right out of the army. Um, they're they're throwing away. He was in Frank Capra's unit, and they would make um, educational films for uh, for the military. And um, when Ray left the army, they're they, are, they were tossing a bunch of uh, unexposed 16 millimeter films, and Ray thought it was a good idea to take those films and do something with it. And he, and he decided to do some children's fairy tales that he could sell to the public schools to show or rent. Um, I'm not too sure how that worked out um, as far as like renting or buying, but it was a pretty profitable business for him. And um, it was closer to puppet animation, which he had done before with the puppetoons, um, but he had always been attracted to the creature animation. Um, and I think he liked, when he decided that it was cool to let us do Tortoise in the Air, what convinced him the most was our, um, our enthusiasm to, uh, to do this for Ray. And uh, we had a gentleman's agreement that we were going to you know, continue with the project, and if he, if at any point he felt like he wasn't happy with it, then he would just veto the whole thing, and we would be fine with it. And um, we, when we, once we got back from Solary Deathmatch, we spent about four or five months just practicing our animation in Ray's style, and just you know, watching um, the fairy tales of Mighty Joe Young, and um, watching a lot of Hal Roach comedies because. He wanted us to do that kind of stuff and watch a bunch of silent films, which to us was not a problem because we had already watched that stuff anyway. So it worked out really well, and wow. it just turned out it just turned out great for us because we realized that we all had the same kind of sensibilities in humor and in style and all sorts of stuff. So he felt pretty confident with us once we sent in the first batch of tests. Very cool. So I mean, how did uh, I mean? It must have been such a, an honor to just be, you know, given the task of animating on a project that he started. I mean, how did you guys, um, uh, was it more stressful? Because, like, if you screw up, you're going to, 
you know, screw up a Harry Housen film, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, you know, it, it was, it was really cool. Cause when we first sent a letter, you know, we would correspond with Ray by letter. Um, and that's what he was used to. And, uh, we would do it that way or sometimes by fax. And so we sent Ray a letter with our intention of what we wanted to do. And it came recommended by the Kyoto brothers and Richard Jones, who had, who had done uh, Aliens, Dragons, Monsters, and Me, and Gary Owens, who did the narration for Richard Jones's documentary that Ray was pretty familiar with, Gary. And um, on their recommendation and our letter, Ray wrote us back. And he said, you know, yeah, let's, let's give it a shot. Let's see where we go. And Shay and I were like, you know, seventh heaven, you know, just <laughs> my gosh and nervous and everything. And then when we first met with him, we were driving back from Ray's hotel room where he was staying here in LA. And we're like, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe this is happening. And then we finally did the final gentleman's agreement at Nathan Duran's house in Palos Verdes. He directed Seven Voyages Sinbad and wow. Attack of the Fifth <laughs> Woman. And, and it was great. We went into Nathan's place. And Ray introduced us, and Ray was very happy and very chipper. And he's like, oh, come on in, boys. And Richard Jones was this. And you walked into like a time capsule because Nathan Duran's place looked like this like amazing like mid-century house, but somebody had stopped decorating in the 70s. <laughs> there was like shag <laughs> carpeting, and everything was really tastefully put together, like decorated. And he had a lot of like Asian antiques all over the place and Nathan comes waddling up and he's like, Oh, hello. And he introduced us to Nathan and Ray's like, well, Nathan, these guys are going to be finishing my tortoise in the hair. You know how long it's been? And Nathan's like, no, 50 years. And he's like, well, damn it. That's a long schedule or something like that. <laughs> he made a joke about that's the longest production schedule he's ever heard of. <laughs> and, uh, it was, it was great. And we, we sat down and, um, you know, Richard, sort of moderated the whole thing between us and Ray and Ray brought the puppets out. And when he, when we saw those puppets, like we just, it's, it's hard to explain like how you feel like, Oh my gosh. And this guy's doesn't even know us from Adam and he's trusting us with this stuff. And, and, you know, we did a formal handshake with Ray and Ray's like, take it away. And that's where it went. And Shay and I were driving home after that. And we're just like, Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh, <laughs> you know, it was just like, it, it felt like I had won like, you know, a million dollars. And um, it, it was pretty, it's, it's a hard feeling to describe, but you know, there wasn't any, as far as like stress um, doing stuff for Ray, there wasn't any stress so much as just trying to channel Ray as much possible, as, as much as possible. There was one time where it was a little bit stressful where um, Ray came over and he did some animation after about um, eight or nine months of us shooting the short and he's yeah. like well i'm gonna come and animate and so he came to animate in the night before uh we did a snip test on a ray cine special and it came out bad and so we're like oh man and we had a backup we had dave allen's cine special that um that chris Hennicott was kind enough to loan to us and so um oh did it, have, did... A, did it have a light leak or something or it it had a little bit of a registration problem Oh. And, and, and a light leak. So it was pretty bad. And, uh, cause Ray had used it to display, uh, for some of the, I think some of the German, um, museums and stuff. And I think it gotten damaged or something. We were using it, but we were detecting some light leaks. So we had to kind of abandon using it. Um, but we didn't find out that the snip test was bad until the morning that Ray showed up and we literally picked it up from the lab and, projected it on the wall and we're like crap and then ding dong Ray was right there he's like I'm ready to go we're like ah! and so you know we, we had to take Dave Allen's camera and just hope for the best that it was going to work and so you know Ray's over there he's like let's get going let's get going and he's like do you have any cutters gloves and we're like uh no and so I was like I'll be right back <laughs> I just split as fast as I could to the nearest, like, like, th uh, um, like CVS to see if I can find it. Or uh, there was, I think it was Rite Aid at the time, and I couldn't find it there. And then luckily there was like a makeup supply store right next to it, and I found some. 
And um, and in the meantime, Shay had to re rethread, or he had to spool the the new camera. And Ray's just, uh, Shay's just like his hands are shaking as he's trying to to get it all spooled up. And and Ray's like, "Come on, come on, let's get going. I don't have any time. You know, let's do it." And so, and so I think that was probably the most stressful time was was that. But it was a good stress because then when everything's set and ready to go, Ray just you know. He, he took a pencil and he just sort of made a little dot on the back of the puppet's head and he took one service gauge and he's like, get out! And he kicked us out and then he just went for it, you know, and, and he did eight seconds in three hours and we're like, oh my gosh. What? And he owned it, yeah. He owned the shot too. It's just, it's one of the best shots in the, in, in the short film. And he's just like, you know, he'd show up next day for dailies and we, he'd be like, play it again. Play it again. Oh, it's pretty good, huh? 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 <laughs> so, it, it was great. It was really nice. That is hilarious. Yeah. Holy cow! I can't. I mean, that's like an amazing amount of animation in that span of time. Oh yeah, he's he. You know, we've talked to other people that have worked alongside him, like Jim Danforth and and Steve Archer even mentioned it in in an email how how quickly Ray animates because you would never think that because. You would think, you know, most people who animate in stop motion are, are fairly slow, you know, because things take time and you want to make sure you get things done right and stuff. But Ray animated with such confidence and he knew what he was doing. He was always thinking ahead. And um, that confidence, you know, sort of equaled his speed as well, you know, and and um, right. he, he just did it. He nailed it, you know, and... So the you know the last shot he ever animated was with Tortoise and the Hare, and every single shot he did was just you know blew us out of the water. And it was just <laughs> good stuff. Yeah. Wow, that's that's yeah. amazing. That's an amazing story. It wow. is. It is. Yeah. We we we. I mean, I that that was a high point in my career, and um, it started off early in my career, and I'm really happy that it started so high. Um, but um, you know, when people ask me. You know, oh my gosh, it must be a dream to work with so and so or whoever. And I'm like, no, you know, it's it will never top working with Ray because we learned so much from him, uh, just on just his thoughts when he would animate and you know his process and just his sensibilities were the most important thing to us. You know, and making sure that you know this job that we were doing was for him. It was for nobody else. And not for, well, you know, selfishly for ourselves too, but, you know, we were prepared at any time if Ray didn't like it, that he would just can the whole thing. And we were, you know, we were nervous at for the first few times because we, we would correspond back and forth and stuff. And Ray would board the, the key, um, the key scenes. And then Shay and I would fill in all the minor detail and he would send us the main boards. And, um, there was a time where, We'd sent in, um, we, we, what we would do is like we would do the dailies and then do a VHS version of them and send them over to Ray. And then he would, he would review them and either call us, fax us, or, or write us. And we didn't hear from him for a month. And we were like, oh, man, he hates us. He totally hates us and stuff. <laughs> and then one day in the mail, this big package showed up. And we're like, oh, man, I bet you it's like, I bet you it's the, like the, the VHS tape smashed to pieces and it just, <laughs> but it was, it was like a whole, you know, a whole bunch of pages with some beautiful artwork of, of Farmer John's Gate and the, and the windmill and the carapatch. And, you know, we were over the moon about that stuff. We're like, oh my gosh, he loves it. He loves it. And wow. a really, really nice letter complimenting us on our shots and how we were able to restore the tortoise. And, you know, he was just very pleased with it all. And, and that really boosted our confidence to just move forward with everything and, you know, knowing that we were on the right track. And we even did a, a number of shots without surface gauges or, or video frame reference or anything. Really? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, because that's sort of how Ray did it sometimes. You know, he went by feel. He, he knew the personality of each puppet, and so he knew how it would need to move. And so we tried to do that, too. And it wasn't as good as Ray's, but we were pleased <laughs> with how it all turned out. Wow, I didn't. I, I thought he always used surface gauges. He he did a lot of the times, but sometimes he wouldn't. 
And, um, you know, it just depends on how he felt about it. And, you know, if it was a quick shot, he would just go for it. If it, if he needed to, like, get from one point to another, I think he would use a surface gauge. But um, it, I guess he would just sort of depend. It would just depend on how he wanted to tackle that shot at the time. Sure. Wow. Yeah. So did he ever give you guys any sort of advice when he watched your shots? Like, you know, um, use more exaggeration or you know, like, was there anything he ever cri uh, critiqued in your work? Yeah, he would critique us a lot and he would compliment us a lot too. He really, um, you know, if he saw a shot where, you know, there's a shot that I did that didn't get used where the hair is sort of like, you know, I had him walk up to the gate and sort of look around before he locked it. And um, I kind of lingered a little bit too long, and I did a little Oliver Hardy finger waggle. And um, Ray liked it, but he just felt like it didn't contribute to to the pacing of the film. And so he's like, "Cut it!" And so we just get there, and he and he, you know, he looks around, and he, and then he cuts it. Yeah, right, and then he then he closes the gate. And so um, you know, Ray would tell us like, you know figure out what your point is and get to it, but don't dilly-dally too much on the animation unless it's a, an important character um, moment, you know. So that was really important stuff. And he, you know, he also encouraged us to push the, the, the movements a lot farther than we expected to. Um, and, you know, it's like what, when someone is animating and they're thinking, like, I'm going to move like Ray Harry has, and the common fallacy that people have with Ray's animation is they feel like it's um, not as bold, the movements, or um, or it's sort of like just continuously moving, and that's not the case. If you step frame like parts of of uh, Seventh Voyage of Sinbad where you see that Cyclops rip that tree out and like kill those kill those poor guys, yes, that that Cyclops is booking across and there is no measured increments or anything like he just takes it and gets it to his point and and he's got strong poses all along the way and that's what's the most important thing is is to get the point across and not to relish in the animation itself it's like you're still telling the story and that's what Ray always pushed on us is like you tell the story and do whatever you need to do to tell that story and don't don't meander and don't take too long because people will get bored with it now, so uh, now one of our um, our visitors, uh, Leo Lionel Orozco, <clears throat> he just uh, made a comment. He said that one time he heard uh, Ray say that, um, in regards to frame grabbers, that he Ray said, "I don't want to know where I've been, but instead focus on where I'm going." <laughs> That's exactly true. <clears throat> yeah, he he never looked back at what after he he after he started animating from one frame to the next, he would just move forward. Wow, that's amazing, and <laughs> it works. Because there's no point in looking back at it, you know, like you've done it. So always look look to the future is pretty much his mantra, you know, and um, he did it. And and I did ask Ray at one point if he ever did takes that he didn't care for, and he said there may have been one or two, but for the most part, no. You know, he would just move forward, and, he, and you know, he really thought about his shots, too. He didn't just go in there willy-nilly. He would really give it some thought of exactly where he was going and stuff and just think about it and maybe do a couple of thumbnails, you know, about what he wanted to do. We have some, um, we, we gave him some, um, exposure sheets that he, he can make, take tracks of his, um, of his, his, you know, the amount of frames that he needed to take. He didn't really mark it or anything. He did do a little, some thumbnails there about with, with the character sort of doing some cute little poses and stuff and he was trying to figure it out but um no he never he never wanted to change anything about what he'd already shot because it's already done you know it's sort of like a painter with their painting you know it's up on the wall why change it right you know you learn from your mistakes and from your your you know your accomplishments so how do you think he um, he handled the cel uh, skeleton sequences where he has, you know, seven skeletons uh, or is it seven or one, two, three, four, six skeletons in uh, in one shot? Um, I mean, it seems like that would be impossible to, to not use like a dozen surface gauges and, you know, an exposure sheet for each skeleton. And I mean, was it all just so natural for him that he was just able to 
you know, just do it and not really have to give it much thought? Well, that that's a lot different because um, I he he never talked to us about his process when he did that scene from Jason. But as best as I can tell, he probably you know numbered each skeleton one through uh, seven or six, and um, and each one of them I'm sure had a gauge because he did have to map out which the the action of each character and what they were going to do and when they were going to die or get their head chopped off or whatever. And, um, so, it, you know, it is a process and, and, you know, he was also shooting at rear projection. So, you know, he was able to, you know, see where he was going by where he was on the frame with the live action actors fighting against those skeletons. Sure. Um, yeah. So, you know, it, it was a tedious shot. I mean, I think, uh, Ray did say that he would average about 12 frames a day on that shot. Oh, wow, so, really? Yeah, yeah. So it took him a while to do it because, you know, you're talking about multiple characters and each character has their own individual personality. Yeah, isn't it? That's it's pretty... I mean, that shot to me is sort of like the pinnacle of stop motion that you can almost keep all of those characters in, in one brain, you know, one one... One person. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's tough. I mean, I mean, we've done that before. We have multiple characters and, and it's really just sort of trying to keep track of each character and and really treating it like it's it gets easier for me. My personal like process is that, you know, if I do multiple characters, I'll number them, you know, or go like clockwise or however makes the most logic to me and then I'll I'll give them each a little personality like oh this one's kind of you know this one's kind of clumsy and this one is a little bit more of a straight arrow or whatever and and then I sort of start adding a little bits of of just even if they're just background characters I add little bits of um you know something that might give them some personality and stuff and you know it's not <clears throat> it's not always moving them either sometimes you know, with a strong pose, you can keep a character there for for a while. You know, Mark Davis used to do that all the time when he would animate. You know, with with his Disney stuff. Sure. So, um, so I guess uh, time is kind of short now, guys. Uh, maybe what we can do is take a couple of questions. Um, if anybody watching would like to to ask Mark any questions about uh, either animation or his experience with Ray Harryhausen, um, please uh, ask now. Yeah, I have about 10 minutes, so. Okay, excellent, yeah. excellent. But, uh, yeah, it's really, I mean, it's really amazing how <clears throat> Ray really put himself out there and just, um, you know, th did he ever, do you think he ever had any secrets uh, that he left with, or do you think that everything has been in his books by this point, or? You know, um, I think that there's always something that, you take with you after you go and you know the one thing is like Ray said you know in his books that he wrote with Tony Dalton that he revealed all but the one thing that we get a small insight of is his imagination and his you know how wonderful it was and everything and um, you know we, we we can only guess what was going on in that head of his, you know, and I think any secrets is just how he felt about certain things, you know, and, and there are very close people to him that probably know that, you know, know what he's thinking and stuff, but, you know, he, he was just, he had one of the best imaginations, uh, you know, of, you know, of our times. And, and I, you know, I know he kept that imagined imagination with him until until the day he passed, I know it because whenever, you know, even in casual conversation, he would like just refer to some, you know, monster creature or like something silly that only somebody with uh, a vivid imagination can come up with. So, yeah, he, he took stuff with him, you know, and but he left so much for us that, you know, pe you know generations beyond us are, are, will be enjoying and, and being inspired by, you know, and a quick note that I have to say about Ray and his stuff is that, um, you know, I'm not, of course I'm partial to Ray cause you know, he was 
he was one of my mentors and, and I cared for him a lot. Sure. But if you look at what he's done, you know, his body of work and all the characters that he made and everything that went into it, it's still to me more breathtaking than what you see today, you know, because there's sincerity in what he does and there's um, enthusiasm and, and passion, you know, and imagination that goes on with everything that he cared about. And, you know, maybe the studios wanted to make a lot of money off of it. And Ray knew that, but he didn't let it bother him as he was moving along. And sure, he had schedules to uphold and everything, but um, I have yet to see a piece of animation that uh, has more heart to it than Ray's stuff. Sure. I think most of the people here would agree with you on that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they would too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we did have some questions. Uh, let's see here. We have, uh, what was the first one? Um, Metal Mad Cat is asking, is there going to be any sort of birthday tribute um, for Ray when it comes up? Um, yeah, I, I've been in touch with Tony Dalton um, uh, over at the Ray and Diana Harry Housen Foundation. And um, there is a, a memorial planned for, they're doing a private funeral for Ray and a memorial is planned sometime in September. Uh, no dates have been firmed up yet. And then over in LA, I've been sort of in communication with the American Cinema Tech. And uh, the, throughout the month of June, they're planning on uh, uh, just screening as many Ray films as possible. And um, it's not, nothing's nothing set in stone yet, but um, they, they're going to try to show some of his fairy tales and maybe some other little surprises and possibly have like a guest uh, every weekend come in and, and just sort of intro the films and stuff. Uh, I'm not too sure just yet because we're just starting to work on it right now with them. Um, and I'm kind of busy, so it, it's, it's hard to, you know, help curate something like that. They're, they're doing most of the curating and, and Shay and I are just sort of like, like, cool, can we do this? Cool, can we do that? Cool, can we do that? <laughs> you know? I, I requested Mysterious Island because I really love that soundtrack. And um, I don't know why, but I really, you know, I really enjoy that film quite a bit. Okay, awesome. Well, the next question is uh, from Ron. He asked, did you keep in touch with, um, with Ray for the years after um, Tortoise and the Hare? Yeah, we did. Um, Ray, whenever Ray was in town, um, he always made it a point to stop by and visit us, and um, he was always really pleased with our progress of what we were doing with our stuff. And he knew, like, I know that Ray, you know, didn't really do puppet animation um, except for the fairy tales and some other small things, but um, he knew that's sort of what we had to do to, to make ends meet, and we also enjoyed doing it. And um, Ray, Ray would be excited. He'd come in and, you know, he came in during our Monster Safari pilot. And he's like, oh, boy, oh, boy, you know, and he really loved it. We had him sign our wall. He did a little drawing and stuff. And he'd always ask us what we felt about the current films and stuff and confide in us how he felt about them and stuff. And so over the years, yeah, we did keep in touch with him. And, you know, whenever we had a, an opportunity to have dinner or lunch, uh, we would do it. And, um you know, we communicate through facts and everything. And towards the end of his life, um, it was harder for him to, to type and stuff. And so I would um, communicate with Ray, Seamus and I would, through Tony Dalton, because it was easier for Tony to, to you know, he would go and visit Ray every day pretty much. And he would just sort of convey um, whatever we wanted to tell Ray to, to Ray. And, and uh, we sort of went back and forth like that. The last time we saw him was... Um, for his 90th birthday and uh there was you know we got to speak and everything which was uh, quite an honor and and uh, the next day there was a party for him and stuff and so you know we got to we got to see him and tell him how much we cared about him and everything and um the last thing that ray told me personally was i told him we were going up to inverness to um to loch ness because we were over in the united kingdom and i all my life i'd been fascinated by the loch ness monster and um I told Ray, he's like, hey, Ray, we're going to go up to Inverness to see the Loch Ness Monster. And he's like, oh, really? Well, watch out for those midges. They'll bite you. <laughs> and that's all he said. He didn't say anything about the, the Loch Ness Monster, just the midges. So, <laughs> and then when I got attacked by the midges, I knew what he meant. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. Wow. 
Um, okay, well, we have uh, a few more questions. Is that okay if I ask some more questions? Yeah, I can do probably like three or four more. Okay. Um, well, Paul is asking, um, is there a way to get hold of the Pit and Pendulum on DVD or a Blu-ray? Do you know about that? Um, you know, I don't know a lot about that. I know that um, Pit and the Pendulum ended up not being an official Ray Harryhausen short. Um, I, I know that there was a teaser that was done, and um, I think that there was a few projects in the works with Ray's name on it that he ultimately decided to rescind. And I'm not too sure, so I wouldn't quote me on it, but I think that was one of them that he didn't, he took his name off of. Um, I wouldn't really know that, I, I just know that there was just a teaser made and I don't think anything else was done. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know though. I mean, that's sort of, I heard that through hearsay, so I wouldn't, you know, take it verbatim. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Peter is asking, would you say that despite his age that he acted a lot younger than his years? Absolutely. Without a doubt. Ray, Ray, was, Ray was always, he was always that, you know, enthusiastic 25-year-old, you know, or 18-year-old that just loved what he did. And his age didn't stop him from doing anything. And, you know, as he went along, you know, he just he piled up his wisdom on top of his enthusiasm and it just made him a lot stronger. And I think that it's safe to say that his imagination and his youthfulness stayed with him until the very end. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. And beyond for, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Um, let's see. Uh, what's the next question? It looks like, um, Mark, do you have any puppets or set pieces from the tortoise and the hare? <laughs> um, we actually do. Um, we have a, um, it's actually on tour right now with um, the state fair, I think that's what it's called, where they, they kind of tour around from state to state and they have um, some, you know, state fair, whatever it is. And they, they have like a little interactive tent and every year they do a different theme. And um, a couple of years ago, it was, it was animation, and it represented, you know, two Ds, uh, CG, stop motion, all sorts of stuff. And um, the comp they they approached us to do contribute some stop motion um, uh, puppets mm -hmm. and sets, and so we loaned them um, the Farmer John's gate, mm -hmm. and, and we made a duplicate tortoise puppet and a duplicate fox puppet. Um, for some of the special effect shots that we did, uh, the stunt shots for those, uh, for the short. And um, they were completely fabricated just based off of Ray's stuff and, you know, some molds and casting and stuff. So um, we have that. And right now it's on tour. So if there's a state fair by you, I would check it out to see if they have an animation section. Um, and then there, we just have, um, we have the Wishing Well set still. And uh, that's pretty much it. Cool. Everything else, sadly, everything else got destroyed um, because um, we didn't have proper facilities to store them. And the weather just and the ages sort of took them away from us at one point or another. You know, plus sure. they're pretty gigantic, so it's hard to hold on to sets. I think we have a couple of trees, too. See, Now, I remember seeing some um, some pictures, and I think you had a blog, or I can't really remember where I heard this, but... Um, didn't Ray teach you sort of his set building techniques with like plaster for the trees and all that kind of stuff? He told us um, it was a lot of just detective work because whenever we'd ask Ray too many questions, he'd be like, that was 50 years ago. What do you expect to me to remember everything? Sheesh. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of like, you know, he did tell us some things about the sets where, you know, he's like, oh, I would make the sets out of plaster, but I would you know, go out to the desert and um, pick some creosote um, branches to attach to the trees and stuff. And, um, you know, he would tell us along the way, you know, like color palettes and stuff like that of what he wanted us to keep and everything. And if he didn't like certain elements that we put in, he would just say, get rid of it. And we would be like, okay, no problem. Um, <laughs> and, and a lot of it was really just looking at the existing footage that had been shot and really just studying it and making sure that we had it down. And we were able to sort of glean 
a lot of information just off of that because you know we kind of felt like we didn't want to bother Ray too much with stuff if we were able to figure it out ourselves we did it and uh, the other things that we didn't know how to do we we would ask him sure and if, yeah I guess if you asked him a question it would take like two weeks or so to get a response <laughs> uh, well you know if they're if they're urgent questions we would call him and, and ask him or um, or we would fax him and he'd, he'd fax us back oh okay okay yeah so it's a little we, bit have, <laughs> we have all that correspondence till it's 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 you know it's one of our treasures oh i bet yeah yeah wow. yeah and so how did you um match the lighting and and the the look of the film uh, from the original pieces that you cut into it? Like, how did you guys match all that stuff up? Well, you know, we looked at some pictures that Ray had uh, during some of his fairy tale productions and tried to figure out what, what, what he was going for with the lighting. And um, we kind of messed around with the lights until we kind of got around to a point. But we also asked a good friend of ours, Tony Dublin, to help us DP this. And, you know, he did most of the lighting and, and he was able to, I'm not a DP and um, I have very limited lighting uh, skills. I, I, I can light my own shots if I need to, but um, I certainly defer to the people that are uh, the pros at that kind of stuff. And Tony knew what we wanted. And so he, um, you know, we watched all the films together and Tony's like, okay, I think I got it. And so we, we would do more snip tests and actually send them over to Ray uh, for the first couple of times and sort of take a break until we heard back from him. And Ray seemed to be pretty happy with it. Cool, cool. Yeah. And luckily it was like a lot of forest canopy, so you can get away with a bunch of cucaloris and everything, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. It was mostly like the key lighting was just sort of like, you know, figure out where the sun's going to be and then and then just do a bunch of, throw a bunch of branches in front of those lights and then just do a fill light here and there, you know, make sure you don't have any harsh shadows and that was pretty much it. And made sure that we didn't have a star pattern of shadows of the character on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I guess uh, we have one last question. And uh, sure. now Paul is asking, um, did you shoot the Taurus and hair on similar equipment to raise original shots? And he, he says, sorry if you already talked about that, I missed the start. Oh yeah, no, not a problem. Ray um, loaned us his uh, Codex Cine Special that we shot on. Um, we shot about half the film on that before it went um, it went bad, and we used the same exact techniques as Ray would do. We did an eight frame. Um, uh, we would roll back the the film eight frames and do an eight frame transition when the when the characters would switch their expressions. Um, and we built things the same way Ray would, would build and we tried to use all the same materials that he did. Um, and you know, we kind of, we kind of did that whole thing and we went, you know, we went total like guerrilla style on this cause we know that's what Ray did on, on all this. And so, you know, cause he answered a bunch of our questions regarding how we were approaching it. Um, it was really important for us to, you know, to do, to do it the same way that he would have done it to sort of just help keep the feel of the film the way it is, you know, to have that atmosphere that it, as if it were unearthed after 50 years of just being stored in some, you know, locker somewhere. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, Mark, it's been a really awesome time to uh, hear your stories and, and get some insight in Ray Harryhausen. And uh, it's just, just thank you a lot for, for coming on here and, and talking to, all your fans and uh, you know people, of course, I think feel the same way uh, about you, about Ray. And uh, I don't think anyone here will disagree with anything you said. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's been really, really an honor to have you on the show. So just well, thank, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And and you know, thanks, thanks out, go out to everybody who, you know, uh, lo loves Ray's stuff and and likes our stuff. You know, I still find it pretty uh, surprising to me that like people actually like what we do because you know all we do is a bunch of googly eyes and buck teeth that running around like fools and <laughs> we really enjoy what we do so for people to like that is you know we take it very seriously and and we're very honored by by everyone's enthusiasm for what we do um so it's very much appreciated to all of you heartfelt thank you well uh that does uh conclude our interview
And thanks again, Mark. And uh, also thanks for all your questions for everybody who asked. And uh, Mark, you're always invited on the show. Anytime you want to ever come back on, just just let me know. <laughs> okay, cool. And, yeah, uh, maybe I'll drag Seamus and Chris on with me next time. That would be awesome. It really would. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Appreciate it. All right. Well, we will catch you later. Okay. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. So, uh, everybody, that was Mark and uh, a really awesome interview. And it's I know he's been really busy, too. So <laughs> the fact that uh, he came on just to share his, his time on here is it's really, really nice of him. So uh, um, that is our, our tribute show for Ray Harryhausen. And, and of course, the show is only, uh, we have about 15 minutes left or so. So we are going to discuss uh, another project, which, you know, of course, since Ray Harryhausen has passed away, uh, you know, where does everybody go from here? And that's kind of the question that um, I wanted to address at the end of the show because a lot of people are, are wondering, you know, who is the next Ray Harryhausen? Ray Harryhausen or uh, Willis O'Brien or, or something like that. Is there going to be somebody who just kind of uh, takes stop motion to the next level? And really, um, you know, I don't think you can really compare any particular, uh, how can I put this? I don't think an individual can ever really replace Ray Harryhausen. And, and it wouldn't really be right to think that, you know, we should really expect that. But, uh, there are people out there, of course, many of them who, who visit our show each week, who are actually pushing the, the envelope with stop motion. And uh, I think Paul Vortex is one, Peter Montgomery, and Ron Cole, uh, among others, of course. Um, but those are three that are prominent who are always uh, the most vocal on the Internet about uh, using techniques which are similar to what Ray Harryhausen used. Um, but, of course, Ray Harryhausen what he had in his day, what the technology was, is what he used. And so uh, film and digital, there's really no conflict there. I think that if digital cameras existed in, in Ray's time, he probably would have used digital only because of the ease of uh, compositing shots and stuff like that. So um, today, really, we, I mean, people are really, um, they take for granted what, what is disposable technology wise and and what they can um, just buy for a hundred dollars you can buy a hundred dollar uh, stop motion capture program a five dollar web camera and uh, you know a, a big thing of foam latex for seventy five dollars like a gallon of it and just have at it if you want to and all of the the technology and all of the tricks and everything um, are already out there on YouTube to, to discover so uh, anyway, um, let's see if I can get this zoomed in here. Uh, Peter Montgomery has been working on some, some shots. And in particular, if you guys remember the biplanes in, uh, in King Kong, uh, Willis O'Brien shot those all on film, and there was no, no particular thing such as uh, motion blur or green screen, really. You know, it was all mostly done in camera if they could um, Dynamation is, is almost you know completely done in camera even live action elements sometimes like smoke or uh, you know I don't think they ever, they ever really did any sort of filming of birds flying across the sky I think most of the time they animated those but like smoke elements for example and sometimes even like water elements could all be shot live by backwinding the cameras and double exposing things and but today you can see a similar biplane model that uh, Peter actually put together and painted and, and assembled and shot it against the live-action uh, background about a plate and so <clears throat> what it looks like is uh, is very realistic because uh, in stop motion of course everything is usually very crisp and I know that a lot of people, I think there was a, a discussion on Facebook recently where some people were saying that, uh, oh, you know, stop motion is known for crisp edges and, you know, I, I like that look better and I like this look better and, you know, kind of going back and forth as to what is right and wrong, you know. But the reality is there, there's no actual right or wrong to it. It's just a matter of what you what you like. 
And so uh, Peter has been working on these shots. Uh, let's see here. Let me backtrack a little bit. Um, just kind of revealing all my conversations here on Facebook, but uh, he did send me a lot. Of, oh, here it is. Here's the video. Uh, let's if it will load up here. Let me let me load it up on another box here, another tab. Um, <clears throat> so this really, I I personally think that um, if you're going to pr push stop motion, it doesn't really necessarily have to be different than what Ray or other people have achieved, but it's a new way to way to approach stop motion is to make it look like it's um you know it will work with a live action shot and blend together a little bit better so here you can see the biplane coming in and you have a a handheld camera um which i i presume i think i think peter said this was all a nodal nodal point uh shot where the camera is is moved on a nodal point and so there's no um Oh, how can I explain it? It's a little bit hard to explain, but the camera basically pivots right where the the exposure would be taken, or where the CCD would be. And uh, but anyway, it looks really awesome. Uh, there's some more shots, I believe, in stills that illustrate how how he did things. Let's see here. Okay, so here's another shot where they've got some explosions, where some planes crash. And uh, I don't know how well you guys feel about all these shots, but to me it, it's pretty exciting to see how um, all these different elements that Willis O'Brien would have done um, in a camera is all done in computers. But it's all real. All of these, uh, all these objects are real objects, so they reflect light properly. Um, here is a shadow on the side here that that is along the ground. And so this spy plane crashes. And one of the things I noticed is that uh, the propellers aren't spinning. <laughs> so I know that would probably probably be changed. And these aren't final shots. Uh, this is a, a test shot, but um, for the most part, it's, it's pretty astounding how how this pterodactyl moves and, and really blends in and all in stop motion so it's definitely a new approach oh there's audio too okay let me see i must have it on mute let's take it off mute and watch it again here Awesome looking stuff. And uh, here's a still image. Basically showing all the way the ways that uh, things were were done um, in a crisp sort of image here, but you can see that various things have motion blur. Um, everything is blended in terms of color correction. So let's see here. Uh, and Bob Bob Harling is saying I could watch that all day. <laughs> and Ice Pick Method says, yeah, with the audio, I didn't even notice the missing props. <laughs> and uh, Peter says the actual plates will be shot with a real plane. And Ron says, uh, not so new, really. It's fundamentally the same process as the past just made easier by technology yeah i basically yeah it's definitely an accurate way to put it uh and squirpold says yeah you can do a lot with all the compositing ability oh peter says not real biplanes just background plates <clears throat> so anyway this is really you know where the future of stop motion uh a certain portion of it is going and it's really pushing the boundaries of you know something that maybe Phil Tippett would have done with Go Motion, 
Um, and I know, you know, Peter and Ron might differ a little bit on, you know, what is better? Is it better to, to blur in the camera or to use software and so forth? And, um, you know, there's def definitely different ways to go about it. Uh, I think Peter, if I'm right, aren't you blurring these, um, with one of your, uh, what is that? Like that little wire finger thing that you, you move over the wings so that they shake and you take a long, um, not long exposure, but you, uh, so I know there's a trick to it, which is different than what Ron would use. Ron would probably use something like, um, revision effects, motion blur. I think that's the program. <laughs> yeah, Ron says, uh, Peter and I don't really disagree. We just do what, whatever works. Yeah. Well, and Peter says, uh, pretty much, pretty much Ron, but we'll go to town with, with it like a movie sequence. Yeah. I remember we watched Peter's video on how he added motion blur and it's, it's all done in his camera, but really fantastic still images. And here's a, here's a picture of the model he's using. And oddly enough, you know, it's kind of weird how uh, adding the um, motion blur gives the planes a lot more weight to them. Uh, that's one of the things I always noticed in King Kong was that the planes look, even though that they're a, a really well-made scale model of the original biplanes, um, <clears throat> there's something about it without the blur, it takes away the weight to them because you're so used to seeing airplane films where there's blur. And I think it just psychologically uh, sticks out and in, and in my opinion you know if you're gonna do stop motion and, and you'd like that sort of static look without motion blur um, it doesn't really work with with real stuff though I think it works better for mythical creatures but that's just my opinion and here is uh, Peter I believe explaining uh, here we go his twanging that's what he calls it twanging Right, okay, um, this here is the mock-up of the Terrasaw puppet that I'm making for the next film I'm doing, which is the Omega device. Um, the real thing involves a very detailed stop motion puppet with uh, metal armature and so on. However, uh, the difference being that the wings are pretty much like this. They're very springy wings, which is just wire. They're a lot more sophisticated and a bit smaller. I anyway, mean, this is just a plastic mock-up thing for these test purposes. But what I've been doing is uh, in real motion stuff, not digital motion blurs. Before I used to use a um, uh, fishing line here or thread to tug the wings, but it wasn't too kind of controllable. It was kind of all over the place. What I've got now, so I start the shot, this test shot anyway. And a little metal device, which is like antlers almost, with all the sort of strategic points positioned beforehand in the puppet. So they all line up with this section here, the bendy um, elbow point or hand point, and the very tip of the wing, seen on the other side. So these are all lined up first. Then I've got to take my first frame. You're probably wondering why the picture frame rate's very odd here, and that's because of this. What I'll do is I'll actually, I think we call it twanging. We're trying the wings, and during that time, take a photograph. So make sure I'm ready for this. I think that worked. If it didn't, we'll give the, the video anyway. Uh, so what it does is actually create a, a blur with not a lot of effort. Because that's obviously just moving relatively slow, as opposed to so very fast-moving wings like this. So I've dropped the shutter speed down to a special shutter speed that I found works perfectly. And I'll just continue to animate the bird, a flying reptile, um, traditionally, but doing this with every single frame and clicking it off when I need to until I've done the whole motion. You know, and I'm back up to this point. The last set of 10 frames before I finish, I bring this thing back in and line it up at the point here, just to ensure that when I finish the shot, you know, eventually all my points line up again to this marker device, which allows me, for test reasons, to loop the footage. Because I'm not about to sit and animate, I don't know, 20 flaps or something. 
So that's 25 frames that are actually shot of this from start point back up to top again, so not a lot. But the motion blur really fills in the gaps and gives it this beautiful sort of realism. Well, you know what real motion is, and that's essentially what this is, but on the cheap. Um, tripod across just fits into that. You can move that to pan it about if you really wanted to. But the upward and downward motion that you saw, or possibly will see, is put in in post just with a simple pan system. Ease in, ease out, so it's smooth as opposed to sort of robotic start stop type thing. It's all the really rubbish. Uh, and the green screen, so you can see it or key it, whatever. Um, the actual puppet will be a lot smaller, but it's all very fun stuff, so you should give it a go and uh, let me know how it turns out for you. This puppet's actually off to Paul McConaughey, who, um, as I said, I'd give it away, you know, for nothing gratis, not like it's a big prize or anything, but it's useless to me now, I don't care. It's a nice little thing for a shelf. Anyway, better go because these are 500 watt halogens and I'm getting baked. And I'm not used to that because I'm British. Okay, see you later. Alright, so a very awesome explanation of how these things were uh, created and, and animated and blurred. Um, very neat technique and obviously it works well. So uh, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I think that it's true. You know, it's really not so much different than what Ray Harryhausen might have done. Um, you know, it's it's pretty much the same thing, just with modern techniques. And and so that's really where where the you know the present is, and probably where the future is is headed. Um, Paul said something. Um, digital compositing is only noticeable if the digital compositor isn't particularly good at it which is a good point. Um, hmm. And Ron says, we're not, not doing this just for fun. I truly believe that when we have a real uh, of modern realistic stop motion, it's really going to convince the indie film producers to trust the process. Oh, okay. So uh, Peter says he just sent me some pictures. So let's bring those up. Yeah, there's actually a lot more I want to show. <laughs> but uh, let's see here. Um, did you send it to my email or did you do it over Facebook? Because this particular picture is pretty cool too. Really nice. <clears throat> <laughs> and uh, Ron says I feel more determined now than ever before that uh, since Ray has passed now it's a mission that's more important you know I, I kind of get that same feeling from the community as well that after Ray passed that a lot of people are just they they really realize uh, maybe maybe because they realize you know you don't you don't really live forever and and stop motion is really important to a lot of people and and if they neglect it I think it was just sort of like a wake up call in a way um, you know that that we should really uh, you know carry on the torch I think is is more Oh, Peter says there was actually a motor inside of, of that puppet. Now I understand how it is. All right. Because Ron said there was a rubber band, so somebody's lying here. Somebody's lying. Ah, okay. Here's the picture. Thank you, Peter. Peter sent me the picture of uh, <laughs> of Ron Cole with the, uh, with the puppet. Here it is. <clears throat> Which is really cool. It's actually a pretty big-sized puppet, too. Pretty nice sized. And uh, Ron says, I, I only met Ray once when I was 15 to 16 and it left an impression on me that, that won't leave. And Peter says it's a 19 inch wingspan. <clears throat> wow, that's pretty large. And Leo, his comment says, not much mention in mainstream media, but the internet which cater to more niche have pretty good coverage of Uncle Ray's passing. That's a good point. <clears throat> but uh, 
I would say I would say the opposite. Um, I noticed a lot of mainstream places mentioning Ray's Ray's passing. But yeah, you know what? I guess I guess in a way you're right though, because it's mostly online stuff, isn't it? Not your uh, <clears throat> not your not going to be in your Sunday morning newspapers. That's true. So yeah, I, I guess I can stand corrected there. But online, a lot of people have really spread the word. Which, you know, mainstream media is kind of point worthless anyway. I don't know. I don't even read newspapers. But, uh... Yeah, guys. Yep. But anyway, uh, on that note, guys, I guess um, that does conclude our show. It's already been past one hour.